Welcome back to the Eagle Forum YouTube channel. I'm Colleen Holcomb and I'm joined once again by Ann Corey. We're going to be discussing episode two of Mrs. America. And we released the first episode of our review of the program in an effort to set the record straight. And we got a few questions from some members of our audience. So we're going to start with some questions from episode one. Uh, and we got a question about uh, Phyllis being shown in a bathing suit. You mentioned that that was unrealistic. Not possible. Not well, possible. It was in a bikini. Now, she wore a, a one-piece bathing suit to swim in our backyard pool. But I assure you, know, she never wore a bikini or allowed me to wear a bikini or ever would have pranced down a, um, a fashion show. But she did do some modeling. Isn't that right? When she was in college, she did some modeling to, to earn a little extra money, but she certainly never did lingerie or bathing suit modeling. But she was fully clothed, exactly right. Uh, we had a few questions too about some of the depictions in episode one with Congressman Phil Crane. We talked about that a little bit yesterday. I just, I'll summarize a little bit to ask, from what you knew, did your mother ever feel like she was a victim of sexism? Was she asked to take notes in a meeting that she should have been running? No, my mother never would have uh, allowed to be pushed around because one thing that she always was, was direct. I mean, women followed her, but men respected her. She never would have, it, wouldn't, it would be inconceivable for a man to put his hand in the small of her back. Not only would that not have, not only would the man not have dared to, she wouldn't have allowed it because that was how her presence was. She always carried herself in a way to command a room. And I think that's important in understanding part of her success is that she didn't suffer fools. She didn't wait for somebody else to talk. She would walk into a room and command it. I did think one of the best lines they had was in when she walked back into that room with Senator Goldwater, she said, I don't think anybody in this room can call himself a Republican if he supports the Equal Rights Amendment. Now that is a line that she would have said. That did sound like Phyllis. That's exactly right. That's absolutely true. Uh, okay, well, let's get into some questions from episode two, which was about Gloria Steinem. And we've talked a little bit about this episode offline. What was your response to the way that Gloria Steinem was presented as opposed to the way Phyllis was presented? Well, Gloria Steinem is presented as having a fabulous, exciting life in contrast to this dull, boring, small town, married with family life. And it, it really, I was, I kind of thought that Gloria Steinem came across as shallow. Uh, I mean, she seemed to be very concerned about her hair and her nails and her eyeglasses. And it, I, it didn't show her with any depth. If I were Gloria, I would be a little miffed at that kind of uh, portrayal. But I believe they were trying to have a contrast with the, the lure of the New York single life being much more attractive than a being married with children in the middle of the Midwest. You're right, and you wrote an excellent column about that that I just saw, and I thought that was very generous, and I think it's a good point. We know that Phyllis is not being presented accurately, and I don't think this program is very fair or flattering to the feminists either. Well, for one thing, it shows her as, as not being a loyal person. She's not loyal to her, uh, her friends in, on her side of the fight as she betrays Shirley Chrism, and she is not loyal to her boyfriend. You know, in, in another episode, she cheats on her boyfriend. Well, is that a, who, who wants to be seen as, as someone disloyal? Right, yeah, that's right. Um, now, Phyllis is also presented as somewhat disloyal to her. Um, in the first scene where Phyllis is shown, she's getting a call and she lies to get off the phone. Um, she's talking to one of her, uh, the, one of the volunteers. Oh, Colleen, you worked with Phyllis for many years. <laughs> Is it possible that Phyllis would lie? Phyllis never needed an, an excuse to get off the phone. She would say, actually, sometimes she would even say goodbye. She would just hang up. So that's right. <laughs> but I mean, the idea that she would manufacture a story like that, it's I mean, crazy. there are people 
who were quite clever and good at little white lies, but that was, they, they missed what she would do. She would just say, I got to go. I'm not, I can't, I can't talk to you right now. <laughs> That's Bye. exactly right. Yeah. And she's talking to a volunteer in Oklahoma who is giving Phyllis the good news that the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated in Oklahoma. And instead of being excited, as we know, Phyllis would have been thrilled. She's shown as jealous and competitive, saying, I wrote the article. All they did was hand it out. Do you think that was accurate? I think once again, the producers miss who Phyllis Schlafly really was. Phyllis Schlafly had a cause and she wanted the country to be a better country. She fought the Equal Rights Amendment because it was the right thing to do. It was never designed, she never, she did not engage the battle to create a platform for herself. When her lieutenants had success, she cheered them on and told them they had to go out and tell others how they did it so that everyone could learn from their success. And the idea that she would try to take credit for what one of her lieutenants did is just not who she was. No, it's not. And in fact, so many of the Eagle Forum, which is the successor to the Stop ERA organization, so many of the volunteers say, Phyllis had so much confidence in me that I never had and that I didn't think I deserved, but Phyllis made me believe I could do it because that's how she was. She empowered other, predominantly women, to go do what she was doing and she was thrilled to empower them to do it. She didn't want the glory, she just wanted to get the job done. Well, what was most important to her was that the Equal Rights Amendment was defeated. Everything else paled in comparison. Right. That's exactly right. Well, uh, this episode shows one of the battles in Illinois, the, um, which was one of the major battlegrounds for the Equal Rights Amendment. Do you remember that first battle with the uh, homemakers baking the bread and leaving the notes that ended up being so successful? It, certainly the idea of the home-baked goodies is true and the all these women did come to their uh, state legislatures and give their their representatives baked goods and I think they were a variety because they were you know they, they were the specialties of the people who were bringing them the homemakers and it is true that the they uh, the loaves or the cookies or the, the pies and the things that they brought always had a tag on them that said from the homemakers to the breadwinners. And uh, that was part of her, her strategy. And it comes under the category which my mother always believed in in politics, honey catches more flies than vinegar. That's right. Well, and then we see the opposite impact from the feminists, from the legislators who were very upset, who were telling Phyllis, you just got lucky. And they made the point that they make throughout the series that, the talk, that Phyllis just made up her talking point. She's shown as going on at the Phil Donahue show, and they said, do you bother to fact check your arguments? Um, can you talk a little bit about where Phyllis got the arguments against the Equal Rights Amendment? Did she just make them up, or where did they come from? So my mother was studious. And one of the things that she always read was what the opposition wrote about uh, their about their arguments. And so the book that she got most of her arguments from was written by now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, written in the 1970s called Sex Bias in the U.S. Code. And this book was a gold mine for my mother in understanding the arguments of what the proponents of ERA actually wanted. Because Ginsburg talks openly about all of these laws that must be changed if in order to achieve equality. Now she wanted these things to be changed, but they were all kinds of laws that would be harmful to women if they were changed. And so when you talk about, as the movie does, about the effect on women in the military or the effect of women in schools or athletics or in any privacy situation. This was laid out by Ruth Bader Ginsburg in the book, Sex Bias in the U.S. Code, written in the 70s. The other book that, that my mother used and, and 
duplicated and, and sent out to her supporters so that they could understand what the proponents were talking about was the handbook for the National Organization for Women. My mother uh, often said that she printed more copies of that book than now did because she found it so illuminating on what their point of view was and what they wanted to do. So she may be criticized for having fear-mongering, but all of those statements came from what the proponents said and wanted. So I have a copy here. This is from my manual in Lobbying Against Equal Rights Amendment, but Sex Bias in the U.S. Code. And here's a copy of the Phyllis Schlafly Report, and you can't see it, but it cites specifically to pages in this book, which, as you mentioned, was written by now Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Brenda Feigen Fastow, who is also depicted in the series as being quite active in the fight against equal rights amendments. So this notion that Phyllis was just using scare tactics and making up facts is really not true. She got the information directly from the source. Well, we'll have more as the series goes on. Anything else you'd like to say about Gloria Steinem or episode two? Well, I'll just make one other comment about how well uh, Phyllis Schlafly understood what the proponents wanted is that when she went to law school, one of the required courses was family law, and her professor was highly opposed to her, but they had blind grading for the exams. And so when it came to exam time, my mother wrote her exam from the feminist point of view and got an A on it. So she well understood what the feminist arguments were. I love that. She was very proud of that fact. And I told my son, don't try to be a hero. If you have a liberal professor or a liberal teacher, give them back what they want, get the grade, and then use it to go do what you want to do. Because that's, I remember Phyllis saying, it was blind grading and I gave her back all that feminist drivel because I knew it so well and she had to give me an A. So I love it. Well, I think there's, there, are epi- there, there are bits and pieces in this episode where they try to make Phyllis Schlafly out as stupid. And you can say a lot of things about her, but stupid wasn't one of them, nor was she ever manipulated. I mean, she, she, she forged her own course on this. She certainly did. Well, we'll hear a lot more about that as the series goes on, and I look forward to talking to you more to get the inside scoop. So thank you so much, Anne. My pleasure, Colleen.